Right, so, uh, we are in a Christmas series entitled The Presence of God, and that's kind of a play on words. The presence usually means like the closeness, the, you know, the withness of God, God with us, Emmanuel. But in this case, we're talking about also the presence, the gifts of God that we receive through Jesus because of what happened at Christmas. And the whole Christmas story is about us serving a gracious God, a very giving God. And so the first week we talked about the with God life. Uh, Emmanuel, God with us, was one of the titles of Jesus. And so then last week we talked about God's gift of joy, joy to the world, and what that meant. And that was a lot of fun to talk about that. Um, so this is one of the most famous passages that is read at Christmas time and churches all over. This is probably the most familiar of all the passages that are read. And man, I will tell you, like back in 2011 when I, I had the opportunity to go to Israel with uh, about 50 pastors from around Ohio, which was really cool. Just a bus full of nerds, man. I mean, we went to Israel, and it was amazing. And that was one of those moments. There's so many. And people, before I went, told me, it's going to change your life and change your preaching. Like, all these things that you have preached about and studied and researched, you're going to see some of them. And there were some things that were really like, that's totally whack. Like, and here Jesus sat down, you know, like really right there in the lawn, you know. And so there were things that were just like, I think that's a tradition. I don't know that there's any way to know he sat right there on that hill, you know, or whatever. Would you like a blade of grass from there? Then there was other stuff that was like, whoa, this is it. Like, there's no doubt about it. This is it. Like, this is the town, Capernaum, where Simon Peter, one of his disciples, lived and Jesus spent time teaching and healing like it was mind-blowing stuff and to go to Jerusalem but that time there where we were we had been to Bethlehem and it, you know had already been in Jerusalem a couple days went to Bethlehem which is about five miles away um, but we sat outside of Bethlehem and man I, I almost wept sitting out there and seeing Bethlehem off to one side and then scan over to the hills, you know, I, I don't know how much a, you know, a, a cheap at that time, old iPhone, uh, I guess cheap and iPhone don't go together, but an old iPhone, we'll put it that way, old iPhone can capture those big hills that were in the background, which sitting there was so picturesque. It was like, wow, like that's crazy, but this is pretty much how I think most people kind of envision the shepherds on these hills outside of Bethlehem, like it was kind of close to what I pictured, and that green grass, and then the sea way down there, which you can't see in the video. I could barely see them. A shepherd walking along with sheep and goats following. It was like, are you kidding me right now? It was like, it looked like it was a million miles away down that hill. But I, I remember just being like, it was breathtaking. Aside from like scanning from Bethlehem to the hills, the high-rise apartments that were in the middle, that ruined the scene just a little bit. But I was like, wow, but it was just absolutely amazing. And so um, I just want to, I already read the whole passage, so I'm just going to say today we're going to focus on verse 14. If you want to go to Luke chapter 2, you can download the Bible app for free, Luke 2 verse 14. And this is what the angels say. So first an angel announces the joy to the world coming through the Christ child. And then all of a sudden a multitude, like an army or a choir of angels shows up. And this is what they say. Verse 14, glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. Now, if you're looking at the scripture right there, you'll notice there's an indentation for just that verse. And what that means is verse 14, it just shows us that we think these were lyrics that, that were sang by the angels. And so it's not just talking, talking, the angel said, you know, we indent that because we think this was an angelic song that was saying right there in front of the angels. And the heavenly host means, like I said, it means this is a multitude of angels, like an army or a choir of angels. And it just reminds us that Jesus' birth was a cause for praise. They sang because a baby had just been born just on the other side of those high-rise apartments nearby. Um, but we've been saying, you know, that, that this, this gift, um, the gift this week is peace, and so we're breaking it down like this, that the gift is peace, and it's from God. Like if you were looking at a gift or, you know, a package under the tree, it's from God. That's what it would say in the label. But who is it to? Well, joy was joy to the world. And so this one, from God to 
those on whom his favor rests. Hmm, what does that mean? Well, we'll get to that. So that's what the gift is, from God to those on whom his favor rests, because it always says who these gifts belong to or are given to in these Christmas scriptures. So Christmas is about peace on earth, as the angels sang right there. And everybody knows that, right? Like even people that don't ever go to church are like, I get Hallmark cards. It's peace on earth, I know. I don't know what that means, but yeah, Christmas is about peace on earth, whatever that means. So when Jesus was born, he brought the present of God, the gift of God, of peace on earth. That's what the angels are saying right there. So what is God's gift of peace on earth that Jesus was born to bring? Well, let me tell you some things that it's not, okay? Primarily, God's gift of peace is not political or international peace. That's not what the point of the angels saying, hey, peace on earth. Like, th this is a big deal, what's happening to this baby. So, man, there, there is tremendous bloodshed happening a lot of places all the time around the world. Just constantly. Like, I looked up this last week. What are the major conflicts that are going on right now in the world over the last year where there have been 10,000-plus combat-related casualties just in the last year? Here's the list. Some of you might guess Russia invading the Ukraine. There's civil war in Yemen. There's civil conflict in Ethiopia. There's conflict between the Islamic State and the Taliban in Afghanistan. There's the Mexican drug war, which is infighting in Mexico uh, between a dr drug cartel. And an internal conflict in Myanmar, which I think was the most casualties of any of them. And all of those, every one of those have 10,000 plus combat-related casualties. So if this is what the angel meant, peace on earth when Jesus was born, wars will stop. Then we would look at God and we would say, God, I don't think Jesus' teachings worked or his disciples and followers haven't done what they're supposed to do because war hasn't disappeared from the world. So it can't be that's what peace on earth means. In fact, in Luke 21, in the same gospel of Luke that we're reading from in Luke 2, Jesus said to his disciples, he said, when you hear of wars and uprisings, do not be frightened or surprised. These things must happen first, and then the end will not come right away. And so what Jesus is saying is you shouldn't expect wars to cease because I have come. You know, if anything, it's going to get worse. Like, th that's not what this is about. Jesus, you know, says just a few chapters later. So that doesn't mean uh, that Christians aren't supposed to be seeking peace between individuals and nations. In Matthew 5, Jesus said, happy or blessed are the peacemakers. And, and so Christians should work to make peace, but the gift of peace on earth that we talk about at Christmas, that's not primarily the peace that angels are talking about in Luke chapter 2. The second thing it's not is it's not psychological or internal peace. And a lot of us would be like, rats, <laughs> I want that. Man, I want that badly, especially at Christmas. You know, some would say that Jesus came to bring a spiritual peace like an internal equilibrium, you know, a, a placidity, a perfect poise because the baby Jesus was born. That's what you have. And so at Christmas, the gift to you is that, you know, while the whole family is freaking out in your house during the holidays, you're as cool as a Christmas cucumber. You're just like, I'm cool, I'm cool. Nothing will bother me. What? The Christmas ham just burnt in the oven? <laughs> no problem. That's what Jesus was born to deal with. The Christmas saying, you know, we, what, we want to buy another house right now, but the Fed just raised the interest rate another half percentage point? Piece of cake. No problem. Jesus was born, you know. Or your adult children are in town cussing each other out, far, arguing about politics and, uh, you know, did I say fart right there accidentally? I don't know if I did. <laughs> your, your adult kids are in town fighting with each other and farting. And arguing about politics, I mean, that's what it's like after the Christmas. You're just sitting around farting. You're like, big deal. Let the farts come. You know, you're sitting around. I mean, th th you know, th you don't even have to because Jesus was born. You don't even have to yell, serenity now! Like George Costanza's father, Frank. You don't even need that because th the Christ child was born. That's what this is about. Well, just 10 chapters later, that can't be the peace on earth the angels are announcing because just 10 chapters later in Luke 12... And we don't hear this passage read much at Christmas. Jesus said, do you think that I came to bring peace on earth? No. Why isn't that read more at Christmas? Okay, let's, I, I got an idea why. Jesus said this. 
He says, so it can't be that he forgot, like, oh, crud. Ten chapters ago, the angels announced. No, he says, do you think that I came to bring peace on earth? No, I tell you but division. He said, from now on, there will be five in one family divided against each other, three against two, two against three. They will be divided, father and son, father against son and mother against daughter. In fact, Jesus begins that whole passage in teaching by saying, I have come to bring fire on earth. You go, wow. Like, what is going on? Like, this isn't just the, I mean, that little baby grew up. <laughs> like, what is going on? Now, be care- very careful with that, because Jesus didn't say, I came to bring division between nations. That's not the kind of division he's talking about. You know, are, anytime you see people going to war, nation against nation, in the name of Christ, they're not. Period. They don't get what Jesus is about. Period. Hey, you're Muslims, so we're attacking you, and we're Christians, or we're Christians attacking Muslims, we're Muslims attacking Christians. Nope. Anytime someone says they're going to war in the name of Christ, they're absolutely not. That's, that's absolutely not the division that Jesus is talking about here. What Jesus is saying is, when I come into your life, when I come into your, there's going to be disturbance. When I come into your life, there's going to be disturbance. You're, you're not going to have this wonderful placidity all the time. You're not going to be surrounded by unicorns and rainbows and Skittles and, you know, whatever. That's not going to happen. In fact, you're going to find that people who used to get along with you won't anymore. You'll be like, huh, why, why is that? Because you love and follow Jesus? And, and so Jesus said, I'm going to bring fire to the earth. Wow, I love this quote. There's this guy named J.C. Ryle. He was an Anglican bishop of Liverpool back in the 19th century. And he basically said this. He said, when you become a Christian, a new peace comes into your life, but at the same time, a new fight comes into your life. And, and those two things are just, they're, they're, they're intrinsically related. The peace of Christ and the conflict that comes with it. Like just, and it doesn't mean you're going around picking political fights, no. Like clearly if you're assuming that's what I mean, you haven't been at momentum. It's not going around starting political fights or or being a jerk cramming your faith down people's throats. You will, if you love Jesus, naturally talk about Jesus and how he's changed your life. But it doesn't mean being a jerk to people about it or whatever. So that's not what we're talking about here. But man, Jesus in your life brings disturbance. He often causes conflict and division within a family. I know that from when I became a Christian in high school. I mean, the, the, the child versus parents, parent versus child thing happened to me because of Jesus. And I was confused. I didn't understand what was going on. Like, why would you not want me to go to church? Why would you not want me to follow Jesus? I've not come to bring peace on earth. Do you think I came to bring peace on, peace on earth? I came to bring a sword. And it's going to divide people because of your love for me. It's just going to naturally happen and and so yeah it's not in internal psychological peace and it's it's just it's not that primarily it's also one more thing it's not eternal or heavenly peace that the angels are talking about Uh, it's not talking about here anyways you know you know maybe it's the peace we get when we die like when we go to heaven you know people talk about you know i'd like to die in peace or when someone we love passes away we say rest in peace and so You know, for a follower of Jesus who would be reunited with God and live eternally in community with God and God's people, you know, that's that's a peace. But that's not what we're talking about here. Why? How do we know that? Because the angels say it's peace on earth. This is a peace that's on earth. And so Jesus came to bring us something concrete and specific, and you get it now, here, on earth. It's something you have to receive while you're alive. It's peace on earth. So what is it then? Well, the angels sing glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth, peace to those on whom his favor rests. And honestly, I think one of the best ways this is answered for us, made more clear, is by uh, a song that we just sang. Hark, the herald angels sing. It's written, the great Christmas hymn, written by Charles Wesley. And and some of the first words say this, hark, the herald herald angels sing. That means hark is like, listen up. Okay, the herald angels, herald means messenger. Hark, the messenger angels sing. And then what the angels sing, in quotes in the song, is glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. 
oh, there it is. That's primarily what the angels are talking, the peace that the angels are talking about. What is this peace on earth? It's mercy mild. It's God and sinners at war. But now, somehow through the Christ child, at peace, reconciled. How, how in the world? See, do you see what it's getting at? The peace that we're talking about is not a peace between us. It's not a peace within us. It's a peace between us individually and God. It's, it's a reconciliation of something that's gone wrong. And so the peace, that's, it's, it's a peace that's absolute. It's objective. It's absolutely perfect. And you have to receive it on earth. You can't receive it later. That when a, a first, the first woman and, and man... Adam and Eve sinned. If you look at the whole context of the story, you see a theme throughout Scripture that you can kind of try to ignore. Everyone, everyone tries to write it off like, well, this is not my story. That's not part of my story. But throughout the Scriptures, it describes a war between mankind and God. Like there's this hostility from man toward God. And it begins when Adam and Eve, the first man and woman, sin. It's a rebellion against the perfect love of God and the wisdom of God, it was really mankind's declaration of war against God. And the world rebelled and our hearts became filled with the sickness of sin. And our natural tendency is anger, even, even enmity, you know, toward the real God of the universe. Because we don't want to be told what to do. Nobody wants to be told what to do. Like, I, okay, I think I'll figure out how I'm going to handle my schedule, my finances, my sex life. I think I'm going to handle this, God, you know? And it's a total rebellion against, like, God, how did you create me? What, what was your plan? What was the goodness and the joy and all the fulfillment you wanted for me? And so the Bible repeatedly says that humankind has a hostility toward God. Psalm 2, the first few verses of it, describes in a way that's so strange it talks about how nations, kings, rulers, and people, they vainly plot and conspire against God and his anointed one. The anointed one, that, the other word for that is Messiah or Christ. That's crazy. We're conspiring and plotting against, the world is at war with God. And if you look at the world, like, I mean, I know there are people who don't perceive this, so I understand. But I think a lot of people, and, and a lot of people who might show up at church at least perceive, like, you, don't you just look around sometimes and see how obvious it is that we are a whole world that ha is in a complete revolution against our creator. We've revolted. Like, we've said, I know best for myself. I'll do what I want to do. And I mean, the world is just, and I'm not excluding myself from this, is full of lust and greed and hunger for power and mass shootings, and violence against children, and violence against women, and violence against men, it, violence in the schools, and indifference towards suffering people, and poor people, and hungry people, absolute indifference toward that, and just bottom line selfishness from us. It's the whole world in revolution against our creators saying, we'll do what's best for us, we know best, We'll walk our own way. And all of those things result in a certain turmoil, a certain lack of peace in our lives. Turmoil among the nations, turmoil among the races, turmoil in our marriages, turmoil in our school systems. It just goes on at turmoil in our neighborhoods. Internal psychological turmoil, the anxiety and the worry and the lack of contentedness. And in fact, in Romans 8, 7, I think this is one of the best little summaries of it where a guy named uh, Paul, he's a Christian leader, writes this. He says, Romans 8, 7, the mind governed by the flesh. So what that means is the unspiritual mind. Like, if you don't know Jesus, you don't have a relationship with God, you, you, it's the natural mind, our natural place that we will default once we can make choices in life. We're going to head this direction. Our natural mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. That might be one of the most radical statements in the New Testament of the Scriptures. It's a statement that's difficult to come to grips with. I, I started wrestling with it probably a year, year and a half ago. Just this whole theme of like, my natural inclination, the natural condition of my heart was hostility to God. 
and I've started to see it. There's some stuff I'm not going to say now because I'm going to say it on January 1st. So I'm abbreviating. I just threw it to January 1st. Not saying it now, but it helps me so much understand my own heart. And like, yeah, that is true. That hostility toward God, now I understand it. But this might be one of the most radical statements. Uh, it's difficult to understand. Host, your natural mind, your natural heart condition is hostility to God. Don't you tell me what to do. You're not going to do that. You're not going to tell me what to do. I mean, I know what's best. Christian theologian Jack Cottrell, he said this. He said the natural or unspiritual, you know, the natural mind is hostile toward God. Hostile is a Greek noun that means hostility, hatred, or enmity. It is the state that exists between enemies in contrast with the start of peace. The carnal mind, which is the way the King James Version, the old King James carnal is the way to say natural. The carnal mind governed by the flesh, may not sense itself being an enemy of God and may deny that it is so, but the fact remains. So do you catch what that's saying? Most people are probably in denial that they have any kind of bitterness, anger, hostility toward God, even outside of Christ, even before they would follow Jesus. Like, no, come on. And this, I mean, I can't even tell you how rampant this kind of denial is is so many people are like, what? I'm a good American. Are you kidding me right now? I'm mad at God. I'm not hostile toward God. Oh, you know, I, I go to church regularly. I actually, I show up and, and are denial about the fact that, man, I have some hatred, some hostility. Most people vehemently would deny that. No way. I'm not mad at God. I, I, I like God. I think God is good. I believe in God. But still, there's this hidden hostility toward God in our natural hearts. And the fact remains, most people don't know it or admit it, but they're at war with God, trying to figure out how to shape God in what way they can so that they can live how they want to live. That, that's, that's how we do it. That's how we deny it, too, is we, we, we don't see ourselves being mad at this guy. Okay, I'm dipping into January 1st now. I got to go. Okay. <laughs> just one phrase, just one sentence about it. If we come up with a God that's a figment of our imagination, even a Jesus that's a figment of our imagination, then he's a God we're never going to get mad at or hostile toward all. But when you dig into the scriptures and the God of the Bible, even though he's pursuing us out of love, we get mad because he wants to be Lord and show us the right way to live. And we're like, okay, frankly, that God ticks me off because I don't get to do what I want to do. January 1st, okay, go, move. (laughs) Often... So often, man, when we start coming to church, if someone starts coming to church, or it's been 10 years since they've come to church, often the thing that draws us back to church, it's a good thing, is I want help from God. Like, man, I need help with this addiction. I need help with my marriage. I just, I can't figure it out. I never thought it would be this crappy, and it's terrible. I need help with my marriage, or I need help parenting. My kid is a preteen now. Can't even believe, like, the stuff they're getting into. I was 25 when I get into that stuff, you know? It's like, or loneliness, like, God, I'm showing up. I need your help. Help me. But the thing that most people don't realize is that more than guidance from God, more than some help and instruction from God, what they really need is peace with God. Like, so many of our problems come with, we do not have peace with God. We personally are not reconciled to God, and things are crazy because of it, worse than they would be if we were reconciled to God. So the problems you have with God are because of that warfare that's going on between mankind and God. Uh, uh, Romans 5 says it so clearly. It's all throughout the scripture, but it says this. uh, The apostle Paul says, Therefore, since we Christians, he's talking about, have been justified, meaning our record has been made clean as if we've already paid the price for our rebellion. He says, since we have been justified through faith, We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. While we were God's enemies, we had positioned ourselves as enemies to God. We were reconciled to him through the death of his son. That's exactly what this peace on earth is about. It's about the reconciliation of God and man. Like, so how do you receive God's present of peace? How do you receive that? Well, it's the way that you receive. If you're ever at war, you know, with someone who is more powerful than you, the way that you receive 
the peace would be the same way you would as if you realize you're at war with someone who's way more powerful than you. What do you do? Surrender. You say, I, I, I surrender. <laughs> I realize this, this is not going to work well for me. Like, I'm just going to self-inflict wounds, self-inflict wounds. This is bad. Um, in his book, The Problem of Pain, my favorite non-Christian writer, C.S. Lewis stuff, I, I like okay his fiction stuff, but his non-fiction, I'm like, oh, goodness gracious, it's so good. He just makes me think. Every sentence, I'm like, okay, I can spend a half hour on that. What in the world are you, oh my gosh, can you believe what he's saying there? He says this in a book called The Problem of Pain. He says, the proper good of a creature is to surrender itself to its creator. You gave me the gift of life. You gave me everything. Like, I, I surrender to you. When it does so, it is good and happy. In the world as we know it, meaning fallen, broken, revolting, the problem is how to re recover this self-surrender. We are not merely creatures who must be improved. We are, as Newman said, rebels who must lay down our arms. Oh, that phrase captured me. Now, first off, Newman is, is John Henry, or, sorry, it's Newton, not Newman. That's Seinfeld. <laughs> Hello, Jerry. <laughs> Hello, Newman. Um, so, Newton. Um, John Henry Newton, he was an English Christian theologian in the 1800s, and he wrote a sermon on Christian repentance, which means turning to God. And in it, he said, a person must surrender himself to his lawful sovereign. And then he said after that, he's a rebel. He must lay down his arms. Whoa, that image is so stark. Like, it's just very clear. Like, God, I surrender. Like, you love me. You're pursuing me. You want the best for me. You want good for me. Like, I'm, I'm sorry. Like, this, I'm so messed up that I've been thinking you're trying to keep me from good stuff. Like, I've been trying to think, like, you've been keep trying to keep me from enjoying life because you don't want me to just be greedy and stockpile and never give. I thought... I thought you were trying to harm me because you only want sex for me in this one context between a man and a woman in marriage. I, th I thought that was trying to be harmful to you. I'm so, I surrender. I laid out my arms. I'm like, God, you created me. You know best. My bad. And so we have to lay down our arms and say, I'm, I'm done fighting and, and hating and being hostile towards you, God. And so Lewis says, the cure, though, for that he says it's so painful. Remember, the book is called The Problem of Pain. He says, because we're giving back a will that we have so long claimed for ourselves. Like, we're saying, okay, God, now I'm going to let you lead? Then that's so painful. Like, because I've been doing it, saying I know what's best. I'll do it my way, like Frank Sinatra. I'm, I, all that stuff, you know, like, and to give it back is so painful. Be like, okay, God, I'm going to believe that you're a lot wiser than me as the creator and I'm going to say, you call the shots, and in your grace, I'm going to try my best to follow, and I know I'm going to stumble and fall and mess up, but I'm going to try. That is so painful, C.S. Lewis says. He calls it a grievous pain. Like, this is so painful, and you grieve over, like, okay, here you go, God, I give this to you. And Lewis writes this, he says, to surrender a self-will inflamed and swollen with years of usurpation is a kind of death. Read that again. That's one of those lines, okay? If you didn't get it, you're like, I didn't get what he said, okay? Trust me. That's why I read it for 20 minutes. To surrender a self-will, that means to say, I'm given up to you, God. I surrender to you. I'm going to let you call the shots now and lead me. To, to surrender a self-will that's inflamed and swollen with years of usurpation, years of rebellion, years of I'll do what I want, God, it's a kind of death. He's like, it's so painful, to surrender to God like that. Here's the nutshell of the good news of Jesus. Here's, here's the gospel in a nutshell. This is the story of this war between mankind and God that the angels are coming to announce there's a way for this to be ended. There's a way for this to end. The central message of Christ is this. Humankind sins against God. And they say, we won't do what we want to do. We want to do it the way we want to do it. We want to live life how we want it. And so God kind of surrenders the world and leaves it over to rebel mankind. He says, okay, I'm a gentleman God. You don't want me to lead, then have at it. Here you go. I'm a gentleman God. I'm not going to force you to follow me and walk in the garden with me and have fellowship with me and all. You, you have the world then. So the world's turned over to rebel mankind. But then in the Christmas story, Jesus, God's anointed one, 
God in the flesh enters a world that's hostile to him. You see it all throughout the gospel writings of Jesus. He enters a world that's hostile toward him. He's born into this world. He lives a perfect life and dies a perfect death. And the death he dies is for the sins of the rebels. He dies for the rebellion, the rebels themselves. And now, if someone looks around and says, this is all so meaningless, like the, the violence and the hate, the selfishness, and I get it, I've been a part of that, but I, I just, I went rescued out of the consequences of this. It, th- that we can kind of raise our hand and say, man, I, I want peace with God. I want to surrender. I, w- I want to give my life to God and say, you're my creator, you're my Lord, lead me, then Christ will rescue you as the one who reconciles mankind and God. He will rescue. And, and, and they can ask for forgiveness from Jesus and be a part of that rebellion and being a part of that rebellion, and God will forgive them. And now, it, when you do that, God treats believing rebels, believing sinners is probably the best turn up terminology. He treats believing rebels as if, as if they've done everything that Jesus has done and as if they have suffered everything Jesus has suffered on their behalf for their sins, as if we paid our own price for our rebellion. That's how God treats us. That's the gospel of Jesus. That's the good news. And repentance, it, it, that's painful. Like so many people hear the gospel and they're like, that's too easy. That's too easy. You can't be like that. I have, to, I have to work. I have to be good. I have to you know, weigh my good things. I have to do good things. No, it's all about what Jesus has done, not what you do, what Jesus has done. So people are like, that's, yeah, amazing grace. Yeah, that's too easy. Nope, it's too easy. But it isn't easy because it begins with that pain that C.S. Lewis, that grievous pain that C.S. Lewis is saying, I have to turn my will over to God. And, and repentance, it's like, it's like antiseptic. You know, it's like you pour antiseptic on a wound, and at first it stings, but it heals. It stings so badly, but it heals. It, you, it, you have to hurt to heal in that sense. And, and that's exactly the way repentance works. The only way for you to get peace, the peace that the angels are talking about here is to pass through the pain of repentance and exposure. There's no way to get into that peace with God without going through that pain of, God, I turn to you, I surrender, I submit, and now things are going to be healed, things are going to be better, things are going to be good, because now I have peace with God. So who is this gift to? It says it's to those on whom his favor rests, and that remark makes it clear that this salvation and this fullness are not automatic for everyone. There's, there's certain people who end up with this peace with God. And so the scripture says over and over, I, know, I did not know scripture at all until I was 15 years old. So for those of you who might know what this phrase is, you can feel free to shout it out. This is the interactive portion of the message. Um, is Throughout scripture, a theme that comes up often is the idea that, that God opposes the what? He opposes the who? The proud. God opposes the proud, but God favors the what? The humble. You know what's funny is that verse is three times in Scripture. It's a triple dip verse. Like you get it three times. It's so important. It's like triple dip, okay? Like you like double dip chocolates, like the cookies double dip in chocolate. Oh, man, it's so good. This is triple dip goodness right here. It's like just keeps happening. It was once in the Old Testament Proverbs, and it's twice in the New Testament post the incarnation, Jesus, Christmas, and all that. And so this is really important, but the idea is that this gift of peace, it's to those in whom his favor rests. Who does this favor rest on? The humble. The idea is the gift of peace will only be given to those who are humble enough to respond to God's grace and to say, man, God, I surrender, and I I, I step through the pain, I, I go through that antiseptic to be healed and to receive the peace that can only come on the other side of that pain, that grievous pain of repentance. And so the question is, are you humble enough to respond so that you can be one of those on whom his favor rests? To say, I believe the gospel of Jesus. I I turn to God, meaning I repent. I I profess, Jesus, I'm going to let you lead me. Be Lord. Uh, I'm going to submit my will to you and be immersed in the water of Christian baptism. And if so, man, we can do that this morning. 
what a great way to receive God's presence, the presence of God, of salvation and joy and, and peace. And the great thing about the gospel of Jesus is anybody can come to Jesus, no matter what their record is. And those who choose to be humble and do it, that's where his favor will rest. You know, the truth is, the stuff I mentioned earlier, the angels didn't primarily come for this kind of peace, this kind of peace. Yeah, but the truth is most of those are a byproduct. All those are byproducts of us having peace with God. And so, you know, there will be more peace between people, sometimes political and international, because the disciples of Jesus are supposed to be messengers of peace. Peace, happy or blessed are the peacemakers. Jesus can bring peace between warring people and factions, but it's always a relative peace. It is always a partial peace when it comes to that kind of peace. And then also, there will be more psychological or internal peace for someone who has peace with God. Absolutely. In fact, the Apostle Paul, he said, don't be anxious about everything, anything, but present your request to God. That means, okay, I have peace with God. I follow Jesus. Now, when I get anxious about something, I, I pray about it. I realize God's in control. I can't control this. I'm going to trust him with this situation. And he goes on to say then, after present your request to God, and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Of course, Jesus brings tremendous peace in the heart. Absolutely, it's peace like a river, of course. But that even that is always on this earth, a partial peace. And, and then for those on whom his favor rests, there will also be eternal and heavenly peace. That, that, that absolutely, in fact, it's cool that after the resurrection of Jesus, one of his 12 disciples, John, who has written a gospel, the gospel of John, he notes that several times after Jesus rises from the dead, he starts saying to his disciples, peace be with you, peace be with you, peace be with you. And, and what scholars will tell you is like, that's not just some like random greeting that suddenly Jesus learned in the, you know, like in the grave or whatever. Like, hey, I got a new catchphrase. I'm going to start saying this. Peace be with you is like the bestowal of end time peace uh, on those who will join his victory over death. Like, peace be with you. Peace be with you. Because of what Jesus has done and that reconciliation rising from the dead, now we can have eternal heavenly peace because Jesus conquered the grave. So, Peace between us, peace within us, but, but they all flow out of a peace with God. The lack of peace with God is the, the root of every problem that we have that's killing us right now. The lack of peace with God. But this peace with God is a peace that's on earth. One of the best passages to describe this is Colossians 1. It says, For God was pleased to have all his fullness dwell in Jesus, okay? So pause right there first off. This is what Christmas is about, the incarnation, God becoming flesh. And it says God was pleased to have all his fullness, all the deity is in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. Like the full deity, like, okay, first off, that's mind-boggling. But then it says, and through him to reconcile to himself all things by making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds, the minds being that carnal, unspiritual, natural mind, because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. So, why did Jesus get a human body? Why did Jesus become physical or take on flesh? To reconcile us, to end the war, to give us a chance to move from being enemies to being at peace. Through Jesus' birth and death, we can become, as that passage says, holy, without blemish, free from accusation in God's sight. And th there's no subject to degrees of measurement when it comes to that. Like this peace with God is full and complete and perfect it can be now. And so it's not the subject of degrees to measurement. Once you are free from accusation, you can't be any freer from accusation. Once, you've, once you're without blemish, you don't have any more blemishes to worry about. Once you are made holy, you can't be made any holier. You can't be set apart or clean any more than you are 
by God and what Jesus has done on the cross. Once you're perfect, you can't be any more perfect spiritually speaking. It doesn't mean your behavior is perfect. It means you are made perfect, not by your works, by what Jesus did on the cross. And so whatever this is, this peace of God, it's absolutely perfect, and it's received a defined, defined point in your life on earth. And so the moment you receive this peace, you are more clean and beautiful in God's sight than you ever will be even a trillion years from now. You can't be any more complete or without blemish. The gospel offers peace on earth. Absolute, objective, has to be received here. It's a peace that's absolutely perfect. Let me close with the story. In 1962, I love the story. Don and Carol Richardson went to New Guinea. And they went as Christian missionaries, and they came across uh, the Sawi tribe. And they were a cannibalistic tribe surrounded by some other cannibalistic tribes. And man, this tribe, they were, they were brutal savages. I mean, just brutal. And so, I mean, cannibals says a lot of it right there, right? And so these missionaries learned about a fascinating, like, peacemaking strategy that the Sawis had with surrounding tribes. When they wanted to have peace with another tribe, this is how they do it. The Sawis would give one of their babies to that tribe that they wanted to have peace with. And that baby, that child would be raised among them and it would grow up, he would grow up, he would learn to work among that tribe, he'd learn their history through storytelling probably, you know, he would maybe get married and he would live his life among that tribe and that's how it would go. So as long as that Sawi child was growing up among the people of that other tribe, it would guarantee that the Sawis wouldn't attack because they wouldn't want to kill one of their own blood. And so that was how they made peace, and this baby was called the peace child. So they would offer the peace child as a way to make peace between the two. But when the Richardsons heard about this, because what a missionary does, if they're a good missionary, even in the States, moving to a new city, they try to contextualize, like, what do people know here? What is the culture here? How can I speak the gospel in their language? And so they contextualized this and, and used it to communicate the gospel, the good news message of Jesus to this tribe. And they used it to tell the Sowies about God's peace child. And they said, you know, even though we've rebelled against God, God so loved the world that he gave his son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. And when we put our faith in Christ, we're no longer enemies, but we're at peace with God through this child, Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. So as Charles Wesley put it, hark the herald angels sing, glory to the newborn king, peace on earth and mercy mild, God and sinners reconciled. Let's pray.